Welcome to the Matt Bernier Show. What's going on? Welcome to the Matt Bernier Show here on DRF TV, live.drf.com, livestream.com, Twitter, and Facebook for the Daily Racing Form pages. Again, it's pretty simple. Daily Racing Forum's Facebook page and the handle for the Daily Racing Forum on Twitter is at DRF Inside Post. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. If you listen to this show podcast, you've got YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, video.drf.com. You've got a bunch of ways to find this show. Today is September the 22nd. We are moving along through the month of September, almost into October, which means we are coming up and closer and closer to the Breeders' Cup World Championships. First weekend in November down at the Del Mar Thoroughbred Club. And as we've done over the past handful of weeks here, we're going to kick things off talking about some divisions and kind of giving a little bit of a top five as is currently stated and constituted. You know, obviously things change, injuries or whatever it may be, poor performances. But I figured today, why not dive into the, the fast horses, the quick ones, the sprinters. We'll see. They're going to go six furlongs on the main track down at Del Mar. We've talked about how the track at Del Mar has been a little bit wonky. You know, certain horses have taken to it, certain horses haven't. With some of these horses, it's going to be the first time that they've set foot on that racetrack, so you're not going to know until they actually get there. The only good thing is most of them, you're going to at least get some works or some gallops over the main track before or during the week. So maybe you do get a, a final workout down there, but at least you'll get an idea of whether or not they seem to be comfortable over the racing surface or not. Uh, so let's dive right into it. As we have, it's going to be reverse chronological order. I'm going to go with the top five. I'm going to start with number five for me anyway is Imperial Hint, and we're going to take a look at his most recent victory. This was in the Don Levine Memorial down at Parks, and as you can see, he's on the front end, and he's in complete cruise control right now. As we borrow the graphic and the uh, replay from out of the gate from a few weeks back, this was one of Dan Elman's horses to watch. And unfortunately, we're not going to see him run again until the Breeders' Cup, barring some sort of drastic change. You see him right now absolutely burying this field. Visually, he's fantastic. Um, the question is, that he, they haven't really tested him much. And I understand he, they were going to go to Dubai, and he got sick. And unfortunately for the connections, they had to kind of nix that plan. But ever since he's come back, I know he won that race down at Gulfstream. I believe it was the Smile Sprint. That was a win, and you're in for the Breeders' Cup. And then he came back here, but he hasn't faced the best of the best. And it is always one of those dangerous things. Do you look awesome beating subpar competition? And what happens when you face really good horses? Do you still look that good? Um, I have a sneaky feeling he's really, really talented. The only reason I have him this far down the list, number five, is simply because, again, he's training up to it. That f feels like, really, think about it, it's going to be about a two-month layoff because that race was Labor Day weekend, and you're going to be training up to that position, the biggest race of your life against the best horses you've ever faced across the country. There's a lot of things there that, I, again, I think he's really, really talented, but that's why I have him down on the list where I do at number five. Number four is going to be a bit of an odd one that I'm sure some people are going to look at and say that's a ridiculous thought or ridiculous notion. I'm going to go with Takaful here, or Takaful, however you want to pronounce it, and we're going to take a look at the King's Bishop, and now it's known as the Al H. Allen Jerkins. This is his most recent start. He's on the lead right now, and he's going to pay the price, unfortunately, because you're going to see Practical Joke come and run over the top of him. But the big thing is the fractions in this race were electric, 22 and 1, 45 flat going 7 eighths of a mile, 109 and 1. I love the way this horse moves at six furlongs. I'm not saying that he can't win at seven. And look, he got run down by a really talented horse. I think he has the kind of speed early on that if you just let him go, and I don't know that they're even considering the Breeders' Cup. I would assume they are, and I hope everything is well, and hopefully we see him in a race like the Vosburg or something else here in the next few weeks. But at six furlongs, man, that horse has got some unbelievable gas early on. And I, that's the kind of dangerous early speed to me that in a race like the Breeders' Cup sprint, I think a few years back to work all week, he went out there at Santa Anita. He set ridiculous fractions, but he kept going. He kept finding. That's what some of the best sprinters do. They're fast early. They go to the front, and they just continue to go on. Think of a private zone. Think of a run happy. Um, I think he's a really, really talented horse. No question about that. Nobody can argue that. I just wonder if they're going to get here. It's going to be the biggest test of his life. I think he's really talented, and I think he could be a dangerous one if they do get there and he's going into it in fine fettle. I think he's interesting. Takaful is my number four horse as far as the Breeders' Cup sprint top five is concerned. Number three is a horse called Ransom the Moon for Phil D'Amato. Ransom the Moon, his most recent start came in the Bing Crosby. And the Bing Crosby we're going to take a look at right now. He's shooting up the inside because, unfortunately, Dreyfong is out there with basically riderless because he dumped Mike Smith early on. Ransom the Moon had everything go perfectly for him in this spot. He had Dreyfong dump the rider. He had Roy H. get floated out very, very wide, and he got a beautiful trip 
underneath Flavian Pratt. I think this is a really talented horse ran from the moon, but there's a part of me that looks at that race and says he had everything go his way. Chances are that's not going to happen in the Breeders' Cup. I think he's super talented. I think he's a major horse that you've got to consider as a contender. I just think he's going to need to run a little bit better if he's going to prevail the first Saturday in November down at Del Mar. It's nice to know, though, that his career-defining race thus far came at Del Mar over that racetrack where there's no question that he can get over and he can act over it. So that's something that if you're a fan of his and you're looking at him come Breeders' Cup time, you don't have to worry about that where some of these other horses, particularly the first two that I just talked about, Takaful number four and number five Imperial Hint, we are not going to know until that week of how they get over that racetrack. You know Ransom the Moon, there's no issue there. He won that Bing Crosby there, again, with things going his way. But I don't want to take anything away from him. He's a really nice horse. Phil DeMott has done a tremendous job. I like him a lot. I think he's really talented. He is number three for me as far as Breeders' Cup sprint talk is concerned. Number two is a horse that we just saw in that race without a rider. It's Dreyfong. He's the reigning champion of this Breeders' Cup sprint. He is the reigning champion sprinter overall. And I'm not going to consider the Bing Crosby his real return to the races. His real return to the races was up at Saratoga most recently in the forego. He went out there and basically did what he did in the King's Bishop last year. He got out to a pretty cushy lead, all things considered, because he's really, really fast. You see the, the half mile, 45 and 2, almost 45 and 3, 3 quarters, 8 and 4. He's a really talented horse. When you don't give him any sort of pressure early on, He's going to make you pay, and he's going to do this to a field. I don't envision a scenario. It, let's just say Takaful does get there, and they decide that, you know what, we want to go on with him. He's going to make life miserable for Dreyfong. Now, Dreyfong, I don't know that he absolutely needs the lead, but I do think if you press him a little bit early, that's going to soften him up. It's going to soften any horse up. And I think, I don't know, I just at, at six furlongs, I know he can do it. Again, we've seen him do it in the past. He did it at Santa Anita. I wonder if his speed's a little bit better at 7.8s, where it just he can carry it a little bit longer. And if he faces some real breakneck speed early on, how is that going to affect him as they go into that final you know, 16th of a mile, where maybe you had a, a couple horses that can sit just off and take advantage? Dreyfong, you don't need me to tell you that he's one of the better horses one of the, that we have in training, period, but specifically for the sprinters. That gets us to my number one horse as far as Breeders' Cup sprint talk is concerned. And there are a lot of really good horses that I have not talked about, whether it's a Mind Your Biscuits, who unfortunately didn't fire in the forego, but we know what he's capable of on his best day. I think the number one horse for me as far as sprint talk is concerned is Roy H. I think Roy H for Peter Miller has done really nothing wrong at all, really ever since they gelded him and they returned him to dirt. Now, I could pull a couple of different replays, whether it was the True North at Belmont Park that was on Belmont Stakes weekend. I felt like that was really his coming out party where he ran so, so well that day. But then you could go through and say, well, maybe that field wasn't that good. Maybe the, the number was kind of an anomaly or kind of a little bit inflated. I think he kind of squashed any doubt or any question. We're going to take a look again at the Bing Crosby right now because this is him on the far outside. He's in the dark blue silks. And he's being impeded. He got carried about five paths off the rail by riderless Dreyfong. And look at the difference in final margin between Roy H. and Ransom the Moon. Roy H. had to carry, I'm going to just go out there and say, at least five paths worth of distance. And he only lost by a length here. I think if you reverse the trips, obviously he's going to win. But he's going to win, I think, by a greater margin than it would have been had you reversed it and had Ransom the Moon be carried as far out by the riderless horse and Dreyfong as he was. So let's take a look at my top five right in reverse chronological order. Uh, number five is Imperial Hint for me. I think, again, very, very talented horse. He's going to need to prove that he can do it against better horses at a unfamiliar sort of racetrack for him and across the country. Number four is Takafel. Number three is Ransom the Moon, who, again, won that Bing, Bing Crosby. Number two, Dreyfong. He was the riderless horse in that Bing Crosby. But number one for me, if everything goes as planned and they're still training on well, uh, I think Roy H. is a major, major player to win the Breeders' Cup Sprint. I love the fact that he's run well at Del Mar. To me, that is not an insignificant thing for any of the horses that have run over the racetrack. I love that aspect of him. I love his tactical speed. He can be forwardly placed. He can also sit a length or two off of it. And if you do get a barbecue up front, that's not going to be an issue for him. And I just think there's a lot to like here. This is a prime example of a horse that won. There's an equipment change, and it was the ultimate equipment change. He was gelded. He's just a different horse now. I, I think there's a lot to like about Roy H. Again, Things can change over the next five or six weeks. But right now, I think Roy H. would be the, the one that I would be hanging my hat on as far as a selection is concerned for a race like the Breeders' Cup Sprint. But you know what? We've got a lot of time, and we'll find out how things carry on here 
as we lead up to the Breeders' Cup World Championships. We're going to take a break here on the Matt Bernier Show. When we come back, a quick review of a couple races that we had last week and that we talked about on this show. A couple of two-year-old races from Churchill Downs, as well as the Woodbine Mile. Stay with us on the Matt Bernier Show. Say goodbye to your inner caveman. If you're making caveman bets on pick sixes, you could be leaving money on the table. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you build more profitable exotic bets and place them with one click. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker. Be a samurai with your ROI. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you cut out unprofitable exotic bets before they happen and be the master of profits. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker, the exotic wagering app. Well, the amazing thing about Al Work was just how similar he is to Uncle Mo. I mean, right away of all of Rapoli's babies, he stood out as the most advanced, the most precocious, and the most talented. And that was exactly the same thing we'd seen a few years before with Uncle Mo. Al Work wins it for John Velasquez. To be able to win a grade one like the Wood Memorial and only his fourth lifetime start was very impressive. It is Al Work in front. Twelve twelve on the east, nine twelve on the west. The Matt Bernier Show live.drf.com. If you're following on the Daily Racing Forms Twitter handle at DRF Inside Post or the Daily Racing Form Facebook page, thank you for doing so. Fire away comments, questions, concerns, whatever it may be. Always welcome to hear thoughts and things of that nature. Let's dive into handicapping review. But before we really dive into it, I need to apologize because my recent handicapping on this program, anyway, has been just god awful really really bad just flat out bad so i'm hopeful this weekend changes things that's all you can do in this game everybody rides highs and lows we all go through the struggles the ups and downs the peaks and the valleys Re recently this hasn't been very good for me so and not just the racing the football we'll get to the football later on that's been god awful to start but hopefully uh we can kind of right the ship here as we lead into the breeders cup so again just apologies in advance the review we're not going to show replays because we don't have them of the iroquois or the pocahontas but we'll start talking about those the iroquois i thought a vulnerable favorite was 10 city in that spot uh live long shot trace Eckes, no good there either as a whole i have to be honest with you I didn't think that race was anything spectacular. Um, I understand uh, the tabulator looked good, but there's a part of me that thinks that he's much more of a, a shorter distance horse. I know he got the, the mile on the 16th, but I don't know. I'm not, just, I'm not thrilled. I'm not blown away by that race. I thought it was just fine. Um, you know, do with that what you will. And I'm going to echo the exact same thing about the Pocahontas. Um, and I hate to just be brief with these things. I thought the most likely winner was Sultry. She was terrible. She was off the board. She had a little bit too much to do coming from the back. I'm just going to kind of gloss over those two races and say I didn't think there was a lot in there. And I don't have much to speak of because my selections were really, really bad. So the Woodbine Mile, though, I think this is a very, very important race going forward. We keep talking about Breeders' Cup. I think this is going to be a critical, critical race because the horse that I thought was the most likely winner, world approval, he ended up winning. But really the important thing is how he did it. Let's take a look at the stretch run. By mile tip and comes up leisurely. Julian Leparu looks around, joins full mast. Down the outside, Mudakayev, the real running begins. Trying to get a run as a rod. Tippen trying to get... Mix up there. World approval went out there and buried the field. You already know that. We went over that earlier this week in Weekend Wrap. The big thing is the figures that he earned. He earned a 108 buyer. That was on the heels of a 108 buyer in the four-star Dave. I love the tactical speed. He can go to the lead or he can sit just off. He's the kind of horse that if you start looking at the figs and you look at the prospective field 
for the Breeders' Cup Mile, tell me he's not on the short list. Tell me he's not in the top three at the very least, if not right on top. Right now, as far as our domestic hopes are concerned, we'll find out who comes over from Europe. Boy, I'll tell you what, he really looks like a serious animal. Mark Cassie, Norm Cassie, they've done a fantastic job. They've turned this horse from a nice quality sort of graded stakes winner to, oh man, he might be one of the best milers in the world. I love that he's won on a number of different racetracks, a number of different distances, and that tactical speed, you cannot look past that. I think he's a major, major threat come Breeders' Cup time. I thought he was the most likely winner of not breaking any news there. He did get the job done. My live long shot, Tower of Texas. He just, he never looked comfortable. He was much closer to the pace than he's accustomed to being. Uh, he usually is sort of taken back, make that one run. I don't know. I think a part of it was that he just was kind of taken out of his game, but he also wasn't good. Uh, he was all out under the whip for about a half mile, and he just never, never really fired. He was off the board, finished up the racetrack. So again, that just kind of culminized and, and kind of summed up my handicapping for the past little while here on this show. Hopefully, this weekend is going to be a little bit better because we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we've got three major graded stakes races all at parks. It's a park-centric show, a park-centric weekend here as far as racing is concerned, and especially here on the Matt Bernier Show. Stay with us. Say goodbye to your inner caveman. If you're making caveman bets on pick sixes, you could be leaving money on the table. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you build more profitable exotic bets and place them with one click. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker. Be a samurai with your ROI. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you cut out some profitable exotic bets before they happen and be the master of profits. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker, the exotic wagering app. Well, the amazing thing about our work was just how similar he is to Uncle Mo. I mean, right away, of all of Rapoli's babies, he stood out as the most advanced, the most precocious, and the most talented. And that was exactly the same thing we'd seen a few years before with Uncle Mo. Outwork wins it for John Velasquez. To be able to win a grade one like the Wood Memorial in only his fourth lifetime start was very impressive. It is Outwork in front. Twelve eighteen on the east, nine eighteen on the west. The Matt Bernier Show, live.drf.com here on DRF TV. Let's dive into it, and again, let's get out of this rut as a whole. I hope I haven't weighed anyone down if you've been paying attention. And guess what? You probably have been making a ton of money if you've been fading everything that I've said. So I'm going to hope for my sake that things turn around right now. Let's dive into it. We're going to go in just basically chronological order as far as these graded stakes races tomorrow at parks are concerned. Let's start off with the three-year-olds. They're going to go six furlongs on the main track. It's the grade three gallant bob. Let's take a look at that field. And now, again, if you're new to this whole thing, my odds on the far right side. Not a morning line, not anything else. These races, and more importantly in the cotillion, but this race included, uh, you may have a couple of changes as far as scratches are concerned, but right in post position order, you have the coupled entry of one Petrov and one A coal front. They are combined as far as the odds are concerned. I have made them two to one. They are two to one on the morning line, but I've made them two to one. The number two is Ann Arbor Eddy, nine to one. Action every day, the number three, 49 to one. Running Mate, six to one. American Pastime, three to one. Sonic Mule, 32 to one. Excitations, nine to one. Aquamarine, 32 to one. Glory Stars, 49 to one. I think this is an instance where I understand Petrov and I understand Colfront. They're both really talented. They're probably the two most likely winners of the race. I didn't write them down as that. I didn't make them most likely winners. 
just because I, I don't I don't trust either one of them, to be honest with you. I think Petrov, this is what he's wanted to do. Won't be surprised at all if he wins. Cole Front, I have a, a really hard time forgiving that most recent start. I know it was against better horses than the Allen Jerkins. There's a part of me that doesn't think he would pass a parked car. I, I think he's the kind of horse that he absolutely has to go. And I look at some other speed in this race. I know it, on paper maybe it doesn't look like there's a ton, but I think Aquamarine has to go. I think American Pastime is going to be forwardly placed. I, I just can't imagine him getting away with, with murder on the front end. I don't know. They're just the kind of horses that I don't love, and I know they're going to be a heck of a lot shorter than 2-1. to one. Uh, My pick in the race is American Pastime. I just love everything that he's done. I love everything that Bob Hess has done, just slowly but surely bringing him along. He can be forwardly placed. He can sit just off. But my live long shot in the race is Running Mate. I think Running Mate is really an interesting runner in here for Larry Jones simply because Early on this year, he looked really, really talented and really, really good, and I can understand why they took a shot. They wanted to see if they had a Kentucky Derby kind of horse. And they tried him in the LeCompte, and it was a disaster. And then he was gone for a long time. He showed up, resurfaced down at Delaware. His first start, he had a little bit of a, a bad stumble at the beginning. He was up against it. He ran into a nice horse, Blue Moon Ace, who we saw last weekend run second, I believe, in the DeFrancis Dash down at Laurel. And his most recent start was really, really good. I, I think this horse is improving. I think he's on the uptick. And maybe if you're looking for kind of an interesting alternative to the unco or the coupled entry, excuse me, or some of the other horses in here, maybe running mate. Don't think you're going to get the price that he is. I believe he's 15 to 1 in the morning line. I think he comes down. I think you're looking at that 8 to 1 range. But I have him listed as a live long shot. My pick in the race, though, is American Pastime. Let's go to the grade 1 cotillion. Let's take a look at that field. Three-year-old Phillies a mile and a 16th. This one you're going to have changes because obviously – Johnny V and, and Todd, they're not running all three of those horses. So Thirst for the Cup, Stay Fond, Run and Go, all of them combined 32 to 1. I assume Run and Go is going to be the one that runs in this spot. I think she's talented. I just think this is a lot to ask in a short amount of time. The two is locked down. Jose Ortiz, I don't think he's going to be riding. Again, he got hurt, unfortunately, uh, earlier in the week. He's got a banged-up knee. I think he's taking the weekend off. Don't quote me on that. You're going to want to stay tuned to DRF Live on the news feed to find out if that is accurate. I have locked down, at any rate, at 13-1. to 1. Actress, 10-1. to 1. Proud and Fearless, 49-1. to 1. It Tis Well, 4-1. to 1. Mopatism, 32-1. to 1. Sine Wave, 32-1 to 1, as we turn over to numbers 8 through 10. Teresa Z. Six to one. Abel Tasman, the Kentucky Oaks winner, five to two, and Salty, seven to one. I think the most likely winner of this race is Abel Tasman. We're going to take a look at her coaching club, American Oaks. This was her most recent race, and it was up at Saratoga. And you're going to remember, recall anyway, that this was that race where there wasn't a lot of pace signed on early, and Mike Smith took the initiative and made that big brush down the backside, went to the front, and she held off it late. And I think. Look, a little bit of race riding went a long way. I think Elate got a little bit intimidated down on the inside. Elate is coming along, though, and you can see Salty tried to run on from the back of the pack as well. I think Abel Tasman is the most likely winner of this race by far. I'm not breaking any news there. She's very talented. I don't have any knock against her, other than the fact that it kind of bothers me that they didn't run her again at Saratoga. They had talked about, okay, maybe the mile and a quarter of the Alabama wasn't going to work, but... They had talked about running her against the older horses, running her against Songbird and Forever Unbridled in the personal ensign, and then they just decided to go here. She has a little bit of a, a gap in the workout tab. I, I understand entirely. It's a million-dollar race, and it's another grade one. She wins this. She is a 100% slam dunk for three-year-old champion. Philly, I just, I don't know. I, I know she's not going to be 5-2. to two. She's going to be odds-on in this spot, and if she wins, great. I'm not going to be surprised, and I think there's a, a small opportunity to take a shot against her. My pick in the race, and I'm not calling her anything because she's not really going to be any sort of giant price, but I think it as well has a legitimate chance to upset the apple cart. A live long shot, though, that I almost picked is Teresa Z. We're going to take a look at her victory in the Monmouth Oaks, and this is her on the far outside. She's rolling now, and she's been under an all-out drive, but I just love the way that she levels off and finishes this thing. She puts the field to bed. She's going to extend and win by a few lengths at this point at the very end so I think this is a really up-and-coming horse and I do wonder it's interesting to note that these past two races for her have come without blinkers and I wonder maybe it was just a situation where she needed to grow up a little bit the blinkers came off and now she's taken that giant step forward that so many people clearly from the price tag I believe she cost over six hundred thousand dollars maybe that's all it took was take the blinkers off and she's going to take that step forward I think she's a, a very very live long shot in that race tomorrow afternoon, the grade one cotillion for three-year-old fillies. Let's move on to the co-headliner, but in many aspects, it is the headline event tomorrow afternoon. It is the now grade one 
Pennsylvania Derby for three-year-old males. Let's take a look at that field. You've got a field of 10 going nine furlongs, right in post position order. The number one timeline, nine to two. The number two is Outplay, 13 to one. Watch Me Whip, 49 to one. West Coast, your Travers winner, two to one. IRAP, four to one. Talk Logistics, 99 to one, no disrespect. The number seven, Game Over, 32 to one. Irish War Cry, six to one. As we turn over, numbers nine and 10. Term of Art, 99 to one. Giuseppe the Great, 49 to one. As uh, you can find this, this is the formulated race of the day as well. You can find free formulated past performances on the race of the day page. Uh, if you needed any sort of like, uh, duh moment, the most likely winner of this race is West Coast. We're going to take a look at his victory in the Travers. This was a few weeks ago up at the spa. You see IRAP. He's in those familiar Redham silks and he's trying. He's trying. The problem is at this point, West Coast is actually going to extend here. Now, maybe the, sh the turn back in distance is going to be beneficial, and maybe that kind of levels the playing field a little bit. It's also worth noting from a dynamic standpoint, West Coast went right to the lead here in the Travers when he put on this show. He's not going to make the lead in this race. I think he's the most likely winner, but he's going to need to display, and he has shown in, in the past that he can sit and pass horses, but I think he's going to be facing a pretty talented field in here. I don't have any real live long shot in here. I think IRAP is a main contender. My pick in the race is Timeline. I'm fascinated to see what we get from him. But if we're just calling a spade a spade, the most likely winner of this race by a pretty significant margin is West Coast for Bob Baffert and Mike Smith. And they've got that obscene formulator fact that we threw out there in the Race of the Day video. You can go over and check that out as well. Let's talk about NFL Week 3 trifecta. Just as bad as my horse handicapping has been recently, uh, my first two weeks with the NFL has been god-awful. Uh, one in five. One and five from six games. So we need to get on the right track here and start putting something together. Because right now, right now, 52% looks like a complete pipe dream. That, that ain't going to happen. The good thing is it's early enough. Heck, I'm not saying that I even want 3-0. and I'd love 3-0. and But give me 2-1 and one out of these three games, and I'll feel good. Let's start off Atlanta Falcons at the Detroit Lions. Detroit is plus three at home. You know, you know, I've said it here in the past. I am a sucker for a home dog. And I think the Lions are actually okay. I know they faced the Giants, a team Monday night that I thought I clearly was wrong about. I thought they were going to be a legitimate sort of playoff contender. They look like hot garbage right now. The Lions, I think they're actually okay. At home, give me the points. I've been against the Falcons last week, and I, just in general, I don't think they're going to be as good as they were last year. But guess what? Thus far, they haven't done anything wrong. Um, I know that first week against the, the Bears, maybe it was a little bit closer than, than for comfort anyway, if you're a Falcons fan. I think they're really good, but I think the Lions are sneaky good. And, and if you're going to give me three points at home, give me the Lions plus the three. The second game, the Cleveland Browns are favored. They're at the Indianapolis Colts, Colts plus one and a half. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't back the Browns as a favorite in any circumstance. They still don't have a quarterback, in my opinion. I know Kaiser is a little bit better. Uh, but Corey Coleman got hurt last week. He's got a broken hand. He's out for eight weeks or something crazy like that. And maybe there's a little bit of, of Patriot fandom in me. Like, I'd like to see Jacoby Brissett kind of right the ship. That whole team, that whole game last week in the Colts and the, and the uh, Arizona Cardinals, that was a dumpster fire. That was a really, really gross game to watch. But I'd like to think that Jacoby Brissett, maybe, I mean, he's certainly better than Scott Tolzien. We know that. Um, I'm going to take the Colts at home. Give me the Colts plus one and a half. Again, home dog, give me the points. I have no problem taking that. Give me the Colts plus one and a half over the Browns. And the third and final game for this week's NFL trifecta for week three. The Raiders are on the road at Washington. It's that whole West going East thing. I think Oakland's a, a talented team. They're probably one of the top three or four teams in the NFL. I think people are down on Washington, and I don't know that. I don't look. They're probably not a, a playoff team, but they're not as bad as a lot of people are making them out to be. Uh, Cousins is just trying to figure things out. He's got a, basically a completely new cast of of characters that he's thrown the ball to, maybe the exception of Jordan Reed. I don't know. I, I think Washington's actually not terrible. They're getting three points at home, the night game. The Raiders are coming west, or are coming east, excuse me. I don't know. I, I just, it's a situation where if you're going to give me points at home, as I've said a million times, I'm a sucker for a home dog. Give me the Redskins plus three at home. So a quick recap. Falcons at Lions. Give me the Lions plus three. Browns at Colts. Give me the Colts plus one and a half. And the Raiders at the Redskins. Give me the Redskins plus three. One and five to start the season. Not how we had hoped it would go, but maybe we can right the ship here starting in week three. It is 1230 on the dot here on the East Coast, 930 on the West Coast. Uh, if you've been watching this show, thank you for doing so, whether it's on live.drf.com 
livestream.com, or if you're checking it out social media wise, we have at DRF Inside Post. They have that on their Twitter page. That's the Daily Racing Forum Twitter handle, as well as the Daily Racing Forum Facebook page. If you check it out after we do this thing live, you've got YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, and video.drf.com. Best of luck wherever you're playing this weekend. We'll talk again next Friday. We'll have some other things that we'll go over. Uh, and it's actually going to be a road game for me. I'm going to be doing the show from Maine. So it'll be, may not have actually any of the cool graphics or anything, but it will be an abbreviated show. But there will be a show, fear not. And as we always do here on this thing, we're going to throw it right into the latest edition of Out of the Gate. Best of luck this weekend. Enjoy the Pennsylvania Derby. Talk again next week. Out of the Gate.